Hello guys, today we have a tale of combat and war trophies. I'm here with Mr. Colonel Olson. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good. How are you, Colonel Ooh, Olson? I'm doing quite swell, quite <laughs> swell. Now, what is this right here? I mean, this looks like a rifle of some sort, but it looks like it was beat to hell and back. This carbine is a Model 1873 Springfield Trapdoor, and it has seen its better days, but what's Evidently. great... What's great about this gun is the history behind it. All right, tell us a little bit about the history behind the weapon. All right, so this Model 1873 Springfield carbine happens to be in the 17,000 serial number range. Actually, okay. 17,614 is the serial number of this carbine. And guess what that means? Well, you know what? I'm not going to take a guess. Why don't you just tell me? <laughs> the 17,000 serial number range um, of these guns were issued to the 7th Cavalry, to Custer's, Custer's 7th Regiment. Yeah, yeah, Custer's 7th Cavalry back in uh, 1874. No, just a couple of years ago. Yeah, and obviously, as you can tell by the, the condition of it, with its tacked decorations, its wire uh, reinforcement of the wrist here, mm -hmm. and everything, that this was a Native American capture gun. Okay. So what we have here is a, a gun that was issued to Custer's 7th Cavalry, um, and obviously nobody survived that battle in 1876. Mm -hmm. And it's after the battle, the uh, Native American you know, spirited this away as a trophy of war. Oh my. Yeah, yeah, so that's what we have right here is a, a native capture gun from the Battle of Little Bighorn. And it's, it's got some great history. Now, for those of us that aren't entirely sure of the events that transpired, what was the Battle of the Horn that was both big and little? Little Bighorn. <laughs> the Little Bighorn, well, uh, okay. So the Battle of the Little Bighorn happened on June 25th, 1876 in Montana at a place called Little Bighorn. And historically, it is one of the worst defeats that the United States Army ever received. Ever in the history of the United yeah. States. The entire uh, 7th Cavalry, which was led by Colonel Custer, um, were completely annihilated. They rode into battle and not a single one of them survived. The entire regiment was just annihilated. It just wiped out. Just wiped Every out. single last man. Yep. An entire regiment. That's, yeah. that's no extreme. Survivor. No survivors except maybe I think a horse or two might have survived. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and so who are they fighting against? Um, against a coalition of uh, of different uh, plains warriors. There was uh, Sioux, Arapaho, no, numerous tribes mm -hmm. from up there had kind of joined together. It was one of the few times that a lot of the tribes who normally warred with each other actually, you know, joined together in one force against, uh, against the, uh, the United States Army. That's incredible. Not very often do you know, when they find these guns, they very rarely know which Native American had it. They just find and they say, oh, it was a Native capture gun. Or, okay. or often, you know, these are, uh, you know, just basically rusted frames So and basically stuff. what you're saying is that capture guns were a common event among the Native tribes. They were, especially in that battle, since the yes, Native Americans sure. <laughs> <since the Native laughs> were. Big victories. Big victories. Yeah, the, the big victory there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so these guns, um, uh, there were a lot of these that the Natives spirited away from this battle. But a lot of the guns that have been recovered were actually just dug up relics, um, you know, from there at the at the battlefield. So on itself. the site itself, where the battle happened. That's right. Okay. And um, and so this particular gun, though, we actually know the Native American's name that wound up with this gun, and his name was High Eagle. And what's neat about having High Eagle uh, in provenance with this gun is High Eagle is a well documented. Uh, Sioux warrior who who um, was well known as being one of the last survivors, last surviving warriors of the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Meaning, so in 1951, Life Magazine, you know, which that's a huge magazine, in 1951, Life Magazine did an article about the 75th uh, anniversary of the battle. 75 years later. Yeah, and in that article there's actually a photograph of High Eagle and mention of High Eagle being one of the last surviving warriors mm -hmm. in the 1950s, get you. He was one of the last surviving warriors of that battle and we have provenance that this gun was High Eagle's. So. Okay, so he himself took this from the battlefield. 
We don't know if he actually took it from the battlefield or if another Native American took it and then he traded for it or whatever. But one way or another, he wound up. He had this gun in his He possession. wound up with it. Most likely, uh, you know, he probably picked it up. Okay. But, but we do not have uh, 100% provenance. And he actually picked it up from the dead soldier. Mm -hmm. Could have been another warrior that picked it up. And then, you know, a week or so later, they, they, traded they for did it. some trading okay. or something like sense. that. But we do know he was at the battle. And this gun was from the battle. We and we do know that the gun is in the uh, uh, serial number range that was issued to Custer Seventh Cavalry. So you put two and two together, and it makes sense mm -hmm. that that the gun was at the battle, and High Eagle had to have picked it up. Okay. But the provenance doesn't just stop there. Yeah, I was going to ask, how the heck do we have it here in front of us today? Well, that's that's a a, a little bit more of a story, but so. I'll give a little bit more of the history here. Um, in the 1950s sometime, High Eagle, you know, he passed on and went to the Happy Hunting Grounds. Uh -huh. And uh, a man named William Fowler, who uh, sources say William Fowler was raised by High Eagle, but we're not sure of that. He actually was close to High Eagle in some in way. In some way, shape, or form. Because huh? Mr. Fowler wound up inheriting this gun. Okay, okay. so after... High Eagle died in the 1950s, which was a good long life. Mm -hmm. William got it after him. William Fowler had okay. the gun. And in 1965, Mr. William Fowler passed away. And at his estate sale, the gun was purchased by a gun collector. who's a school teacher, gun collector, a man named Gary Holtus. Uh -huh. Purchased the gun at the estate sale. Now, at the estate sale, the sheriff, who I guess was kind of in charge of the estate sale, told Mr. Holtus, he said, he said, uh, this gun belonged to a Sioux warrior named High Eagle who had helped raise Mr. Fowler. Mm -hmm. And that's how Mr. Fowler wound up with the gun. And so Gary Holtus thought, oh, well, that's cool. I want to, you know, I always wanted a Native American artifact kind of gun. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he put it in his collection. And he, he, like I said, he got it in 1965. In 1970, he decides to sell the gun. And so in 1970, Gary Holtus sold the gun to a man named Dick Harmon. And at the time, he just told Dick Harmon, this is what I know. Um, I got it at William Fowler's estate sale, and uh, it had belonged to a man named uh, High Eagle. The na was the Native American who mm -hmm. had it before that. And so Dick Harmon thought, wow, what a great gun for my collection. He'd always wanted a Native American, uh, you know, decorated, intact gun in his collection. So he bought it in 1970. Then guess what happens? What happens? 1984. In 1984, um, Dick Harmon was asked by Dr. Douglas Scott. Now, Dr. Douglas Scott was head of the Rocky Mountain Division of the Midwest Archaeological Center of the National Park Service. He was in charge in 1984 of doing the archaeological excavation at Battle of Little Bighorn. Okay. So he asked, Dr. Douglas Scott asked, um, uh, Dick Harmon, if he would join the team as the antique firearms expert, because Dick was a, a, an expert in, in firearms. So they're doing research, right? So he starts doing research. Uh, he's there at the battle. They're, they're finding relic guns. They're researching known native capture guns mm -hmm. and all this. And he's like, holy crap, uh, this 17,000 serial number range yeah, you know, it seems like all these were pretty much issued to the Seventh Cavalry, and he said, "I have that gun back home. That's oh. that's that got that serial number range. They actually found guns, um, whether they were native capture guns or or dug relic guns. They found guns within just a few serial numbers of this gun mm -hmm. that were definitely tied to the battlefield." And he so he's like, "Oh wow, I I might have a Custer gun here." So the last two trades of the gun. The people were actually unaware that it could have come from the Battle of Little Bighorn. Exactly. They knew it belonged okay. to High Eagle, but they didn't know that it was, they, they didn't have the two and two put together yet. And so uh, uh, Dick, as he's doing his research, he's all, wow, this, this, this gun was in all likelihood issued to the 7th Cavalry. So then he starts researching High Eagle. He says, well, I, I know the history passed along with it. Uh, came that this man named High Eagle had it, this mm -hmm. war Sioux warrior named High Eagle. So he starts researching High Eagle, and guess what? They what find all this information, you know, like the Life magazine article and other information, uh -huh. uh, that High Eagle was at the battle. He was 14 years old at the time, but hey, uh -huh. 
a 14 year old in 1876 especially a native american hey, that was he, a full grown man he was a full grown yep. he was more man than most full grown men are today <laughs> <laughs> so uh so yeah so um he you know so he uh, the the two dr douglas scott and, and dick Harmon, um during their research they uh, they did research on high eagle they did research on the gun and both of them came to the conclusion that hey this gun was a native capture gun mm -hmm. from Battle of Little Bighorn. And we actually, there's a, a letter that comes with the gun fr written by uh, uh, Dick uh, uh, talking about mm -hmm. all that and signed by him. So we started with High Eagle, who yeah. had the gun in his possession. Yeah. And then to his uh, possible son-in-law, William... Well, we don't know if he was a son-in-law, but, you know, somebody who was... Someone close to the family. Someone close to him, yes. And then it was lost in translation past that to the next two owners that the gun actually originated from the battle. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yes, but um, Dick was the one. So Dick had owned the gun for 14 years before he started figuring out that it was... That it was actually could have been a Custer gun. Custer gun, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and, and what's neat, too, is... You know, Dick isn't just somebody, some willy-nilly collector who's who's trying to add value by connecting it to the Custer battlefield. Mm -hmm. He was actually he was hired to be there at the field to yes, excavate. Yes, he was hired as the expert mm -hmm. for the that archaeological that is, dig. That has to be um, the mother of all coincidences, huh? Yes, really, exactly. What it is quite a coincidence. Uh -huh. uh, so Dick kept the gun until the year 2001. Okay. So at this point, there's only been a couple of owners That's of it, actually. Correct. There's That's only correct. been, what, four owners? Um, yeah, so, yep, four yep. owners. So Dick kept the gun until 2001. A man named Ken Stasiak, who's a gun collector, bought it in 2001. And Ken um, is the current owner of the gun mm -hmm. yeah, right now. So, uh, so only four people have owned the gun since High Eagle wound up with it after the Since battle. the original battle yeah. in the late 1800s. Yeah, 1876. That is incredible. I mean, I've known some used cars that have had more owners than that. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, now, I got to ask, I got to tell you guys, I'm looking at this gun right here, and it looks like something was put in the chamber and it exploded. I mean, it looks like things flew everywhere. What happened here? Well, that's a good question. Um, nearest that uh, anyone can figure... Um, in 1895, there was this li neat little invention called smokeless powder, right? Might have so, heard of it. So we, before that, everything was black powder, and black powder didn't have quite as much bam as smokeless powder. In 1895, smokeless powder comes out. Um, and most likely what had happened is, is um, it, maybe here in a minute you could show a picture um, for the, uh, the viewers of the backside of this uh, firearm. Um, Somebody put a smokeless powder charge in the gun, and when they tried to fire it, it, poof, it, it blew just up. exploded. Yeah, it blew I off bet the that breech block. Huh? It, look, it blew off the breech block, uh -huh. and uh, blew a hole in the uh, in the receiver here. Mm -hmm. um, now there is part of the old cartridge still still stuck, stuck it, in yeah. there. Yeah, and yeah. It, it is a uh, it's a brass casing, which is another good indication that it happened later in life. Mm -hmm. Um, 1895 or later because back during the time of the battle the, the battle um, these would have been copper yep. casings in there that would have been originally used mm -hmm. with it so this is definitely something that somebody put in at a later time uh, not really thinking mm -hmm. and uh, when they did and they, they got a, quite a surprise yeah that was a firework fire. sure that we're yeah. expecting huh yeah now what is something like this worth straight from Custer's battlefield well I think that a gun like this with this kind of history and provenance, and there's quite a bit of provenance. I know we were actually reading some we, of it yeah, earlier. Yeah, we got yeah. quite a bit of provenance with it. Uh, a gun like this, I would expect to bring somewhere between, you know, maybe fifty to to $100,000 to the right collector. My gosh, that is incredible. Even in this condition. Absolutely, because the, the condition of it um, doesn't necessarily, I mean, if it was in perfect condition, we'd be talking... You know, quarter of a million dollars. So or more. big difference. Yeah, big, big difference. difference. Yeah. So a, a fireable um, gun like this, um, I know of one. I think it sold for two fifty or two, maybe it's two seventy five somewhere in there. That was that was very very similar to this, but still completely operable. Mm -hmm. um, in this condition, what you're what you're really buying is history. Um, I mean, it still has a good look to it. 
It can display nicely. Um, the side that's on the table away from us, you know, is obviously the, the prettier side to display because, uh, you know, you can't see the, the little owie here on mm -hmm. the back side. Um, but still, I mean, you know, what's a piece of history worth from the Battle of the Little Bighorn, especially when you know the Native American's name who wound up with, with it, it and had it all mm -hmm. these years? And he's a well-noted figure. You know, he was... He was, he was someone in, of note. in Life yeah. magazine. Mm -hmm. He's mentioned in uh, uh, well, at least one book that I know of. Um, you know, and he was he's tied not only to the Battle of Little Bighorn, but to uh, the uh, Ghost Dance Uprising. I think that's about the size of it. I mean, this is just an incredible piece of history, folks. We know every man that's owned this gun since the time of the Battle of Little Bighorn. I mean. Can you even, how many pieces of history do you know that you can have that much of a paper trail on an object like this? Yeah, I think it's a really neat piece of history. It's, um, it's definitely got all of the bells and whistles that it should have. It's U.S. marked. It's got the well, right Well, we could also say it's missing a couple of bells and whistles, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, so anyways, it's a really neat, neat piece of history, and, and I'm just really proud that we have it here at uh, Western Trading Post, and um, I'm, I'm just excited about it. Well, thank you, Colonel Olson. I think we're, we learned a lot today, and we look forward to seeing what's gonna do at auction. Yeah, um, so for those of you who want to find out any more, we, um, there's some, we have articles on this, we have um, uh, all the provenance, and um, if anyone is interested, this very weapon is going to be in our June 18th, 2022 Advance Collector's Auction, and it's going to be lot number 300. It will sell us lot number 300, and uh, we have an estimated price range on it of fifty dollars to $100,000, and if you guys would like any further information, feel free to check it out at westerntradingpost.com and go to the auction tab. That was westerntrainpost.com, folks. Keep an eye open. Thank you, Mr. Jim.